Hello, we're kicking off our special Oscar Contenders series of the Dolby Institute and Soundworks Collection podcast series. Uh, I'm here with Mark Ulano, who is the president of the Cinema Audio Society. Has, I just turned out, so... I stand corrected, he is the former president of the Cinema Audio I Society. Did, I did the full terms possible. And Carol well, uh, Urban is our new president. Okay, Carol Urban is coming. I'm now emeritus. Um, so, but I am president of the Sound Local, the, sound, uh, the longest sitting president of all the West Coast IA locals right now. Well, there you fifth, go. Fifth term, 15 years. Can't believe it. Sorry. So, Mark, usually um, for these special Oscar con conversations, we kind of have a round table with all the people who are nominated on a particular film. But because Mark is double nominated this year, uh, up for two Oscars, one for uh, uh, best Sound Mixing for Ad Astra, and then another nomination for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I thought it would be fun just to kind of feature you and make you the star of the show and have a wow. have just a sit-down conversation with you about your art and what it's like to get two Oscar nominations in one year. Okay. So congratulations and welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, okay. Let me kick off with, uh, so Ad Astra and Once Upon a Time in, in Hollywood. So you're, you're ba Brad Pitt's best friend. <laughs> It's, uh, those are our second and third movies with him. Uh, the first being Inglorious Bastards. And uh, I can only say it's an incredible privilege because he's an absolutely dedicated, committed professional. And you couldn't imagine two more opposite uh, cinema experiences in terms of production and pr approach and uh, intent and outcome. And um, Brad is central to, to both pieces in so many ways. Um, on Ad Astra, he's also, it's his company producing. He produced the film as well, right? He produced, um, <clears throat> and he's in every single thing in that, including a lot of wire work and inverted weightlessness and space suits that are, you know, everything that you could imagine that would be physically, um, you know, demanding for a performer, um, Brad, you know, succumbed to throughout that and, and never, never didn't come completely ready and engaged and committed and, uh, you know, all for the project. There was no ego involved at all. It was wonderful. It's great to hear stories like that. It's about, the truth, you yeah. know. I mean, he's um, he's pretty special. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I tease you, but... Uh, and I don't get compensated for that. That's my <laughs> that's my personal experience with wor having worked with the guy, you know. And, and if I add up the months, it's, it's a few years of, of production time together. That you've Between, spent with him? Yeah, eight months and ten months and then, I mean, seven months and then... Maybe four ants. So it's a long duration. Well, I tease, but you know, typically with these conversations, we're focusing on the the post production side of things. But mm -hmm. you're the production sound mixer on mm -hmm. these films. So the the audience for our podcast is it, there. There are a lot of professionals who listen in, but we also have a lot of students and a lot of just mm -hmm. film fans as well. Mm -hmm. So if if you'll indulge me for a second, if we sure. could just take a step back and can you uh, give uh, give our folks just a little bit of an understanding about what a production sound mixer does? Sure. Um, First of all, our primary goal is, is to tell stories. We're, um, we capture performance in a way that basically creates the, the connection between the audience and the characters. So we lay the bed. Um, you'll hear a lot, uh, particularly recent times, of comments regarding, uh, you know, just capture the discrete elements and we'll fix it later. That's actually not a real representation of what happens, at least at the high end. What mm -hmm. happens at the high end is, we're mixers, we mix. Right. And what does that mean? Um, for me, my personal approach has evolved quite a bit over the, I'd say this 40 years that I'm doing this, um, but, but it's, it's centrally about coming without ideology and, and, and embracing and immersing in the material that you're taking on and, and um, developing a, a set of solutions and approach that are conducive to the director's intent to the characters and who they are, the journey they're on, and the environment in which they have those journeys. So my, my conversations and, and collaborations with, with directors and, and actors are, is about that, about character. I'm not talking about microphones and impedance and, and choices. I'm talking about, you know, where are we going? Right. And how do we keep that imagination alive? So sitting in a dark room with strangers and they're, they're experienced up on a screen, you never lose connection with the truth of the character that's been constructed, you know. So, so that's what I do. I'm I'm always seeking to have a strategy that connects me that way in the frame of the director's intent, which right. is never one thing. 
Right. You could work with the same director for many years and each project's got its own unique capacity. So what does that mean? An analogy would be the cinematographer. He brings an, a, a complete portfolio of tools to, to the set. He brings a, you know, a full set of lenses to, mm -hmm. be, to be more narrow about that. Um, I, can take a, I, can, I can do this shot scale with you with a, with a 100 millimeter lens backed off, with a 50 millimeter lens, with a 25, and have the same shot scale. Right. And each but one they, of those is saying something different. They have a very different feel. To they, have, they each are communicating something different, and that is that intentional capacity of use is how I, I approach working with with the tools that we have, you know. And so, well, I'm really interested in, in, in what you just said. That's fascinating to me because I hadn't thought about that. Obviously, when you change focal lengths and lenses, and you can move in and out, you can keep the person in the same relative scale within the frame, but but they're communicating something very different from an emotional standpoint. So, what do you? How do you? How are you kind of doing something similar on a sound, uh, in a sound system when you're on the set recording? Well, I, I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, it's not hard and fast, but if I were to give it sort of, you know, categories, um, and, I, and I do that carefully, but what I would say it, it really has to do with almost internal and external, first person, third person, observational and, and being inside the head, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And you're, you may be floating back and forth, but it really is tied to where we are in the story and where we are with the character. Um, and what is being created on the part of the, of the performer uh, right. in terms of the character. So it's all interactive. Um, you can read a script and you can see a, a call sheet and you can have uh, an enormous amount of information, you've been there on the, on the scout, you have an idea of the dialogue between the director and the cinematographer about, about what, we're, you know, but until the day happens and you're there physically at the set and everyone has come together and all the elements are now coalescing into actually making the takes, you don't have the truth. Mm -hmm. The truth is really revealed in that, in that collaboration between the actors, director, the image, and all the other artisans that are on board in the orchestra of making a movie. The crew is really like an orchestra, you know, intense commitment to their particular instruments, mm -hmm. but most coming into the world in full potential when they play together and make, and they play the, the composition together. So I, I experience, I come out of music, I'm, I'm a second generation percussionist and, and my move in my teen years to my passion from that into movies has always sort of fed my my universe, and so I, I, I look like, at it that way. I say, yeah. okay, what is, what is the intent here? And then I, then I try and develop um, an approach that somewhere in my head, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like I, I, I get three pounds of close up in my head. I, it's like, <laughs> in my head, I, I hear a thing that, that somehow connects with what that is. Um, and I think that comes for me from investing early on in pre-production, you know, um, the, the way I break down a script and invest in that, the way I explore my colleagues in the other departments and where they're coming from and um, both inside the sound side, you know, um, I won't, I, I'm deeply, I, I'm, I'm a prep junkie. Mm -hmm. You know, Mike uh, Minkler and I or Wiley and I are going to get together in pre-production and, and go to brunch and we'll spend four hours going page by page or five page or Mark Mangini or whatever. We, sure. we will go through the work as it is on the page and then, you know, what do you think? And, right. I, you know, I'm kind of thinking, that, you know, the, and, and we'll have in this circumstance with this director, speaking of Quentin, a strong instinct about, where our contribution will be absorbed and appreciated mm -hmm. and um, with, with the knowledge that nothing's set in stone, you know, this idea may or may not fly. And that all comes out when you're there on the day and the tr that truth I'm talking about, yeah. you know, that, that, that happens. So it's very exciting because you can prepare and should prepare as much as you can and be a perpetual student about the tools that come like an ocean over us <laughs> every year in terms of possibilities, but if you never lose sight that you're in the, pro your job is to tell the story. Right. And that's something we've been doing since we lived in caves as humans <laughs> around fires, is tell stories. And yeah. we're the current stewards of that, of that craft. And um, as long as that is your purpose, you think directorially, not in a preemptive way, but in a supportive way to the intent of the director and his or hers um, 
concept of where we're going and how we get there and to you know uh, deal with the technique and technology in the way that serves that and also to recognize in deep sense of respect that everyone on a movie is a technical person right I think the most technical work on a movie set is acting day one we're doing the final scene of the movie sure day 17 it's the first it's the first shot in That's the movie right. and then on rap you know, it's the, it's the, you know, midpoint of the movie where, you know, the entire story turns. An actor, a journeyman actor, has to be able to calibrate the particular piece that they're doing now so that when it falls into the proper chronology, the character's arc There's makes sense. Make sense. How technical right. is that? It's, right. it's profoundly technical <clears throat> and it's invisible. Right. And the great ones, you know, the Sam Jacksons of the world or whatever, you know, that are just, uh, you know, you know, he has a nickname, by the way, you know, among other actors. You know, you know what it is? What's Sam Jackson's nickname? The Beast. <laughs> How did he earn that? Because he always comes and delivers. He's, right. you, you, he's never not invested, never not ready, never not prepared, and never not bringing it, you know? I mean, there's, there's a whole host of those, you know, the, these grand, iconic actors. And Quentin attracts them sure. to his films because they know they're gonna be in that environment where they're at their maximum potential. It's not only appreciated, it's invited and, and, and oh, hoped for. Everybody's playing at the, at the top of their game the, on a, on a they're court. They're invited, film. that's right. You know? I like what you said about that because you tend to think, you know, people tend to think of like certain people on the movie set as artists and certain people on the movie set as technicians, but everybody's really both. Every artist is a technician. Right. The foundation, you know, if you're painting, what do you, you know, you, know, you learn pigments and color and perspective and, and, and you know, every, means of communi writing is tech you know it's what we it's weird we're in a time where the word technical is somehow a dividing line a class system almost of mm -hmm. uh, you know that you know we don't respect you know one of the things i do is i try and go out and meet all the manufacturers of the tools that we make mm -hmm. i visit their factories we you know this year i visited the chef's factory in germany and i've been to the, you know I, there's about 15 of those that I, I won't bore you with it but the idea to meet the the passionate dedicated committed artists, engineers that create tools for us to use to do what we do and not see a piece of metal and plastic and, and you know, but see the person behind it and the idea and, their, and have the relationship so that as they keep making what they're doing better, you get to be in a dialogue with them about, you know, if this did this and when we're... Right. And so it's, it's really about trust and respect up and down the chain so that you s see the, the process holistically. Yeah. Does that make any sense? It totally does. And, yeah. and, and I think that really affects possible, you know, you know, potential percentage-wise in, in, to the positive side for outcomes with films. Right. And Quentin is the master of appreciating collaboration without feeling in any way invaded or, 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 or you know, he's so comfortable with his own skin. He's not so, threatened by that at all. No, it's like this is, you know, someone asked him. Where did he find Julia Butters? You know, you know the, the nine-year-old girl who steals every so scene. She, I mean, you should movie. see the scene that's not in the movie that she did. <laughs> no, it's unbelievable. Um, and and Quentin's answer is in a gold mine. You yeah, know? exactly. Because he understands that the 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 director's job is to coalesce all of those elements in a way that that ca that makes irresistible the investment of the audience in 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 the work and. Uh, well, I, really, I love that. I, I love that distinction that you made too um, about first per, first person versus third person kind yeah. of kind of viewpoint in a, in a film, and and it's interesting to me that you're nominated for Ad Astra and for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood because I think those that's that's a great kind of juxtaposition. How different, right? Ad, Ad Astra for me is a very internal kind of first person. This is the this is Brad Pitt's character's experience. And Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, on the other hand, is very sort of third-person objective, it yeah. seems like to me. It, 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 it floats in and out, but it is. We're observers, we're flies on the wall more on, in Quentin's movie than we are in, 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 in uh, James', James movie, movie yeah. because of the very nature of what they are. And, and James' movie is much more literary uh, in, in a traditional sense. It's, it's almost novelistic, you right. know. And, um, and uh, it's funny, I, I was in Germany this past fall and I got a phone call from a, a friend, who's, uh, Marco Spagnoli, is a, a prominent Italian documentary director and his film actually opened the Rome Film Festival this year in, in October. And he called me up and we're, we're in Munich and headed towards Paris and he said, listen, uh, we're gonna have a conference at the Italian Space Agency. Now, who knows there's an Italian space, <laughs> they're nuts for space in Italy is, huh. you know, he says, and 
um, I would like to surprise them and see if you would mind, you know, he thought I was still in the States. He says, if you would mind Skyping in as one of the contributors in the panel, yeah. because we're going to have a screening of the film at the agency with all these scientists oh, and then talk about and talk about the movie. Uh -huh. and, and, I, and I said, sure, I'm happy to help. How can you know? And so we, we made a date and we're, we're but it turns out we're on a Friday night at driving in the in a pouring rain <laughs> on the autobahn at 140 kilometers an hour and I'm in the passenger seat and the guy who's running the whole you know thing that we're doing is six of us doing this con you know these these uh, seminars in, in Germany and France and we're you know, <laughs> you know and, and he says well we're gonna do it at 11 o'clock so we timed ourselves to go to a McDonald's because they have great Wi-Fi at McDonald's <laughs> in Germany so that, and we're gonna do it on a phone you know it's like okay and I get, a, I get a text at about 10.15, a, a listen, we finished early, we, can we do it there at 10.30? Oh <laughs> you know, and I said, okay, let's give it a shot. So he said, so go ahead and click in. And so I get visual with no, with no sound. In the you, car. In the car, in my hand, my iPhone. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, no plug intended. Yeah. Uh, and I see them, there's a 20 foot high screen about this size. And there's Marco in Italian with three or four panelists talking about the movie. And he, he sends me a text, okay, go ahead and punch in so that we've got video on you. And I'm like, I, I hope this holds up. You yeah. know, unfortunately, the Audubon has really good, you know. Who knew? Yeah. And next thing I see, as I'm holding this in my hand, is my head 20 feet tall <laughs> <laughs> behind these guys, you uh -huh. know, in a car going, you know, just jamming. Yeah. And the guys in the car, half of them are asleep because we've been, you know, on the road all, all day. And, 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 and then suddenly a hand comes around with an iPhone with a light on for a key light and nice. another guy, you know, and everybody's like, what the hell's going on? You know, because they didn't know about this. Only the, dry, the person who was head of the thing knew about it. And we do a 15-minute <laughs> interview about what is it that you think about when you're going to do sound for this movie, space movie. And right. I said, well, there's two areas. There's the, the all the organic internal, you know, humanist things, the, the breathing, the, the, you know, the, the uh, limitations of being in suits and ships that have artificial environments and that, and then there's this incredible wilderness void of space. It's virtually opposite. And right. so to sort of design our, our approach and sound around those two things. So very internal, intimate one, you know, close miking inside those spacesuits was a very challenging kind of thing to, sure. to do, the, plus the communication. <clears throat> and then the, all this external stuff. So, so it's, it's, a, it's, for me, a perfect example of the, uh, of, as you described, the, this, you know, uh, first person yeah. inside, internal. Right. Um, and uh, it's not often, actually, that a film will be as pure in that way as that film was. But, um, and, and to go next, and, and it was not an easy film. It wasn't easy for Brad. It wasn't easy for James. James's history is, you know, many more organic. This is a very different kind of movie for James. It's a high-end, science fiction, CGI, effects-driven. Big stakes, big money, big studio involvement. Truly. Sure, and, and by the way, when we, we did a reshoot with uh, Caleb Deschanel, by the way, did the reshoots for mm -hmm. Hoyda. Right in the middle is when the purchase of Fox by Disney took place because the film was right. originally going to get released earlier and and the, everybody was so glad that it had it got pushed you know to a later release because it was a better time in the year for the film and the mm -hmm. film got great recognition in Europe they loved it in Venice they loved, you know there's mm -hmm. this and so uh, uh, you know and and but it was a struggle film to do because of the physicality of things yeah. you know just the sheer complexity of physicality and Quentin's film was the virtual opposite of that it was, it was like being in, you know, you're, 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 you know, strawberry fields forever. We we're in heaven. You can, you can never really tell, but it looked like you guys were having a lot of fun on that movie. I had friends on that show. The Gaffer and I <coughs> know each other for 40 years. Bob and I have working together 18, 19 years. And you've been working with Quentin for 20 plus years. 25 now, years right? at this point. We, yeah. yeah. We met on, um, we met on Robert Rodriguez's um, Desperado right. in Acuna, Mexico, which is a very dangerous, you know, drug, drug heavy border town. And Quentin came down uh, for about three days to cameo in the film. Right. And when he left, he left. It, Pulp Fiction hadn't been released yet. He sent us a print, actually, to watch before the release. And so, like, we got to see Pulp Fiction in a little, you know, community theater in, da in Del Rio. Uh, you know, really? it blew Before our it minds. Up. We had no yeah. idea, you know, what yeah. we, what, you know, uh, it was like amazing. 
And then um, after that, we did um, Robert's next film was actually *Dust Till Dawn*, right. which Quentin wrote, produced, and acted in. Right. And that's when we, he and I, I think, connected and bonded, and everything since. You know, Jackie Brown forward every every film since. Yeah. The only thing we haven't done together was his um, two episodes at CSI. <laughs> so I'm I'm blessed. I want to collect the whole set. So I'm I'm you know uh, I really have a um, you know there's a there's a light over me that has been you know. You know, good yeah. fortune to have that collaboration with him. You know, at Astra, my uh, my feeling is that that was primarily uh, on sound stages. It was. That's right. And then not and, everything, but it was primarily. Then, that's correct. And then once upon a time in Hollywood is primarily locate on uh, a lot of location. Hundred. Work. I think we had. Oh, God, I think it was almost. Was it two hundred locations? One hundred seven speaking parts. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the cast list goes on and on and on, you know, Al Pacino, Tim Roth, you know, there are scenes with great actors doing great stuff that are not in the movie. Right. Um, by virtue of, you know, how that comes down, you know, when, you, when you're constructing a film, so, yes. So, and obviously the location stuff makes your job, that has a different set of challenges for you. That's right, or opportunities, if, depending on your, 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 your perspective. What, what, but one of the questions I wanted to ask you was because I, and you're going to have to explain this to me. So I, I have read that there is no ADR in Quentin's films. Like he gets it all on the set. It's really true. So, but you have these, you know, locations are no, notoriously noisy. How do you, how do you, how are you able to achieve that? Well, did you ever see Galaxy Quest? Dean of course, Paraso's love film. that. Dean Paraso's film, loved it. I love Dean. Never give up, never surrender. <laughs> That's your, that's or your. Or another way of saying it is failure not, cannot cope with persistence. Right. Um, you stay in the game. What is this shot? What are we doing? Where does it fit? How can we solve if there's, you know, first of all, you need to be in an environment where the intrinsic nature of filmmaking is there will be competing elements. Sure. This element is fantastic for the scene, but it bumps up against this element, whether it's, it's lighting, camera, sound, or wardrobe, or props, or... And, and the, the, true, the true definition of filmmakers, which is what is the highest compliment I think any of us can have is that we're filmmakers, is the intense commitment to finding the solution to that collaboration so that it's not quarantined off into some territorial thing. How do we make this work? And so that means it needs to be a safe, there needs to be safety in engaging in the concern. If there, and for me, as I've gotten older and, and have had to deal with thousands of those kinds of circumstances all year in, year out, I, 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 my threshold is, did it break connection with the character? Mm -hmm. Is what happened here or what's happening in terms of the soundtrack? And it's particularly you know, essential with Quentin because he, what you see is going to be in the movie. Right. And so your mix is not some temporary thing and it's not accumulation of discrete elements that's going to be you know, you know, you're laying the bed. He's right. old school when it comes to filmmaking. He's an absolute student of filmmaking, and he trusts that. There's no video village, mm -hmm. you know. So we're not taking the five hundred thousand dollar a day high profile actor and walking over to the, to the village. I mean, it's a great tool. We really need it for very specific things. And but you probably use it quite a bit on Ad Astra because for very obvious essential reasons. Sure, for sure. there because <clears throat> the kinds of things that were going on there, you know. But in, in Quentin's universe, you're it's one camera. It's, it's, it's designed, we have a strong sense of where we're coming from when we get there. The actors have been in rehearsal for weeks beforehand, so they, they, they're not just finding the camera, they're, 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 they've, they've gotten a leap ahead. And Quentin is parked by the camera. He's right there. He's sitting next to the camera with them. He doesn't say, you know, did we get that? He turns to the operator, which is also the director of photography. Right. You know? That's it. And then, well, almost. He, he'll also say, we've got that. Right. <laughs> But let's do one more. Let's get the little sister, which is what he would call it. And why are we going to do that? And the entire crew will come back in concert in unison because we love making movies. You know, you'll, you'll, it right. might be four in the morning, but you're going to, you know. Right. And it's, and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's just, you know, invigorating. You can't, you know, uh, intoxicating is actually the better word. And, and that's the thing. He creates a, a, a universe of trust for the actors. First of all, they feel completely safe. Mm -hmm. They can go anywhere. They can do anything. Um, but within the defined framework of the story that he's brought them in to create. And so, you know, there's rarely intensive improv, but there will be moments like Leo's, Leo's losing it in the trailer right. scene. That's right. Leo. Yeah. And Quentin, you know, scene. he knows if he lights the fuse and lets it rip, 
it's going to be something something special. Sure. You know, um, and he knows when he has to, you know, pull in the reins too. There are other actors that really need they need a hug around them to kind of keep it on target. Keep it, and, and, and he knows the difference between the two, or if it's shifting. Yeah. You know, he's 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 an actor's director. He's a writer who directs and a director who writes, and you know, it doesn't unbalance on either side. It's like. Uh, if we could clone him. So anyway, that's so, that's. But let me. I want to. I want to dig into this a little bit more because I got. So, but what you're saying works because partially because Quentin makes it a priority to get good, clean dialogue tracks. And it's not about the sound. Right. That's Same the thing more. to remember. It's about. It's about the performance. Right. He trusts what he experiences as the performance there on the day. Right. He has the third eye to see that and know. You know, if it were Marilyn Monroe or Gary Cooper where they looked dead and wooden on the set, but, you know, Billy Wilder knew that the take, was catching the magic. camera was, you know, on the screen, oh my God, you know, yeah. nobody yeah. on the set could see it except Wilder, you know, but maybe not even him every day, sure. but yeah. so he, he trusts that. Right. And so he wants the performance that happens in front of him. And so he makes that as part of the arrangement when we're doing Now, it doesn't mean he is ridiculous about that. It just means he trusts the need to support that process. For example, okay, on Hateful Eight, right? Mm -hmm. We have all these amazing scenes that are on the road. I mean, uh, up, up at 11,000 feet in real stagecoaches mm -hmm. that are going to be one, t one, of the one, one take because the snow's gone and we're, you know, it's, the light's gone and there's only four hours of the right line. You know, a stagecoach was a noisy environment. So in pre-production, I'm in collaboration at, at, at complete ac uh, access and co cooperation with the stagecoach building unit. Uh, they're part of the art department, but these guys are specialists in building stagecoaches from scratch. So we're in a conversation about insulating material between the wood to metal contact mm -hmm. and, and you know, uh, how the brakes are built, you know, in terms of, you know, the noise level that, you know, we're in a, collaborative conversation preempting the obvious so that on the day when we're in the scene with the actors doing that their space has been maximized in its protection and you also know what's coming so you don't have a freak out moment when you go on set. We've, that's right we've been on a scout uh, we, we scouted Django Unchained in, in Louisiana maybe seven weeks before principal began and when we came back I'd say 80 percent of the shot descriptions and intentions expressed on that scout were what Quentin, Quentin did. Hmm. Now that you know, it's not Hitchcock, where you know it's a storyboard, storyboard or die. It was, you know, fl fluid. But you really have a roadmap. Right. You can come at it, and and you must always caution yourself, though the grain of salt you need to know that a complete surprise could be thrown your way, at thirty minutes, fifteen <laughs> seconds before rolling. Yeah, and be ready. You know, be ready, you know, uh, on uh, Death Proof, we're doing interior scenes with nine people on a porch, and it's inside, but it's a tin roof, and he wants rain. Sure. Pouring rain. Not only pouring rain, it's in a stage, so there's a big drainage system that's pumping water out, and, and yet, and yet, you know, we do and use all of the tools that we have yeah. to maximize the possibility. Yeah. And those tools have gotten better over the years, too. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because um, you, you had made a, you mentioned that very early on. How has your work changed um, since over the course of your career? And I'm asking in, two, in two, twofold, two facets, technically, but also has the aesthetics of your job changed over the course of your career? Um. Let me answer those separately because they're they're interact they're in, they inter inter interact with each other, but they're they're different. Mm -hmm. The tools have been in a constant flow of evolution, but great sound took place in 80, 90 percent of the films made historically with a single microphone or two microphones and one track. Right. Because of the storytelling. I trust that process to a great extent. So, uh, you know, give me a, a you know a, a, a perfectly tuned Sheps microphone, a, a, a brilliantly talented boom operator, um, actors that are skilled, and I'm going to run with that. Yeah. That said, 
the expansion of our tools to nonlinear file-based recording and the ability, and I learned, I was really lucky to have a, to, to mix a Robert Altman film in the late 80s. I did. Which one? The Kane Mutiny Court Martial, which oh, almost nobody knows, but yeah. it was amazing. In fact, Herman Wouk just died this last week. He was 104 years old. But Herman had written the original stage play, and we shot it as a play, as a film. In, uh, was that a, but was that for television or was it uh, both? Okay. It was, we shot it in Port Towns in uh, Washington, and and it was for CBS, mm -hmm. for domestic and theatrical for overseas. Interesting. Um, and Bob was in exile at the time. You know, he was in was, movie jail. He was in movie jail. <laughs> yeah. But he had Herman Wook there, and his son Joe Wook was a producer, and he had difficult issues with the, with the you know with the with the uh, network. They wanted to know why Brad Davis was, you know, he was t too short. <laughs> I mean, it's a character piece. It, it, it's written, in, you know, you know, it just so. So Altman famously, everybody had their had a microphone. Everybody had their own track. And but this is in 1987. Right. There's no nonlinear file base. Anything. I'm on. I'm on half inch eight track. Yeah. With you know uh, DBX units and you know it's like oh my god you know it's just so you're limited to eight tracks. Seven. You need one for sync. So, <laughs> but that's, is that a limit? You know, Sgt. Pepper's was done on four tracks sure. and bouncing, you know, yeah. it, it's the ideas that are there. You know, I, I think the technology suits the ideas. It doesn't limit the ideas. If you have the idea, then you find a way to make that. That's my, my sense of it. So, but having that experience, we also boomed extensively all of that. You know, everything was a folk mag take, 11 minutes. But it was a great revelation in my brain in advance of the tools that we now have. Mm -hmm as to what facility you can have by having other choices simultaneously, discrete tracks, taking the music studio approach and putting it out in the field. Right. Um, it lets you do things that you, you know, the court reporter has got, you know, very specific kind of sound and a sync, and in take three, he's gonna come across the court reporter, not in five or seven, but he might come back to it in take eight. And, mm -hmm. and so when you can do discrete capture of particular things in a synchronous way, um, you start really building the level of the, 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 the portfolio of, of material captured for the telling of the scene. And with a director like Bob Altman, who could care, he has absolutely no, no, had no commitment at all to things like perspective, all the traditional, uh, you know, uh, uh, rules of the rules. Yeah. Yes, the rules. Yeah. You know, his first gig as a studio director, he got shit canned because he insisted on overlapping dialogue. Right. And that, and that wasn't done. Back that then. wasn't done, and that bruised him. And he luckily hooked up with Jim Webb, and later Bob Gravener. Webb came out of the military, but he was doing live concert stuff, and he had been hooking up with a guy named Stevens, who had hand building half track reel to reels, eight tracks, and 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 Webb met with you know started with Bob on uh, California uh, splits, I think it was, and uh, and ended up doing Nashville, and right. and you know uh, all these other iconic Altman yeah. films that changed the way we think about sound in movies. And, and so... How did working with Altman change your approach? This particular piece. First of all, you throw all you think out the window, and this is the key thing that has stuck with me ever since. It started before, but it really... You cannot come with ideology to the set. You must be open mm -hmm. and ready to learn, be a student of this project, of this movie, of this shot. Right. Be a perpetual uh, sponge and learner to to accommodate the intent. Don't say, you know. Once you're on board, you signed on. You're in the Merchant Marine. You're on the journey. You know. Don't be in a constant conflict with yourself about that. Be a student of what is the real intent of of the director and find. You need to get that trust relationship happening on day one or two, or you're screwed. I wanted to ask you about this because you have worked with some amazing directors in your career. You've obviously worked with Quentin. You just worked with James. You've worked with uh, Paul Thomas Anderson. You've worked yeah, with Robert yeah. Altman. You've worked, you know, I, I work a lot with students, and and students always left out to, Cameron. By the way, I, I forgot about yeah. Dude, I shouldn't that, have forgot about. That I, guy, shouldn't that have, guy, shouldn't yeah. have, I shouldn't have forgotten about about Jim Cameron. Um, the, you know, the students, when I talk with them, they always want advice on, like, how do I get into the industry? How do I? And they're looking for, like, you know, how, technically, how do I do the job? How do I, and one of the conversations that I love having with them is about, yeah, you have to be able to technically execute, but by far the most important part of the job is actually who you are on the set and how you show up. Sets are 
they can be tense. There's a lot. You it's, think? It's very, <laughs> it's high stakes. You've got, you know, and especially the kind of movies that you work on. Yeah. Very high stakes. There's no margin for error. Sometimes You're, very difficult, you know, directors. Especially were, if you have a reputation because now. And you work with movie stars. Uh, and that just adds another layer of, but, but, you know, but, it can be a deficit reality if you're not someone who relaxes into the intensity. Mm -hmm. If you're a nervous Nelly, this might not be the line of work for you. <laughs> but if you can be passionately enjoying the the you know the the the, the fighter pilot journey of you know you know m you know muscling through shitstorms you know back right. to back as as uh, the most fun in the world, um, then then it can work for you. So but but. Okay, so so what do you so for me? Yes, it's onset persona. You know, for me, it's you know the island of serenity and a sea of chaos is a very useful kind of sure. comforting thing for. But 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 behind that, to get to that, you can't fake that. Right. So how do you get to that? Is the other piece of advice that I try to get. We teach a lot. I, I do a lot of workshops around around the world, frankly, and yeah. and. Uh, um, and I think it, it, it comes down to a few things. And this goes back to, to, to being a musician. First of all, get good. Right. Be, be a relentless, perpetual student. You know, Segovia and uh, uh, you know, all the great musicians were pra still practicing every day in their 90s. Why? They Practice wanted, your craft. They right. wanted to get better. They wanted to stay relevant. They wanted to stay facile. Become fluent in the instrument, but don't mistake technique for art. Mm -hmm. Technique is foundational to art. So what does that mean? It means become a filmmaker. Be, a, be an absolutely dedicated student of film. See every film you can possibly see. See films that fascinate you, that puzzle you, that, that you hate, that you love. Become a reservoir uh, of, of the literature of that as a foundational point of departure because you're a part of that continuity ultimately. Right. If you survive career-wise into being given the, 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 the privilege of participating, your work today, I, I was part of a, a car, you know, up at the Egyptian or last year, we, Petrushka and I were part of a, of a, of a, of a panel on, on uh, Cujo and the and Pet Cemetery as these iconic, you know, I, I'm, I'm like when we did those 80s, 80s horror films. You, you didn't think you were working on something iconic no, when you did those, my right? My first film for Roger Corman was Slumber Party Massacre, you know, <laughs> and it was directed by Amy Jones Chapman, Michael Chapman's wife, and written by Rita, Rita Mae Brown, the, 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 the famous... Rita Mae Brown wrote Rita, that? The, the, the famous feminist yeah, author. Yeah. And the, the fundamentals of Roger's film was every 15 minutes, some 16-year-old nubile woman would be murdered with a power drill. And that, <laughs> That was, you know, including the pizza delivery guy, you know, so, um, but it created for me in those days, I suddenly, I was at Rogers for a year, I was with the last generation of what I call Rogers Graduate School. Right. You know, so many people came through there and their careers emerged because he put them under load in real, in real terms and they came out of there. And I, Battle I, you tested know, and ready. I was at 27, right? I had six or seven features on my resume, you know, out of nowhere. And I knew not a soul when I came to Los Angeles, nobody. I, it was like, you know. And so we graduated to Canon Films after that. Uh, <laughs> you really moved up in the world. I, I've, I've talked with Roger about this, you know, because yeah. he would sit at night in the, in the, in the dailies room with the, the DP, the director, the mixer, and, the editor, and anybody else, and he would teach. You know, if we did this, you know, and director, can I get a helicopter? No, you can have a ladder, you know, but, you know. <laughs> but you were really making movies right. with authority over you, having to deliver, a schedule on time, you know, you were not in some hypothetical. Mm -hmm. And he created that. And then he sold it, you know, and, and that went away, you know, yeah. it, it stopped happening. So I, I really feel fortunate because it coincided with my generation. Uh, we're really the first Hollywood generation of fine arts majors to come into the crafts. Mm -hmm. Before us, it was father to son, closed shop, and all the rest right. of that. Sort of a bunch of litigations in the 70s that sort of broke that sort of open. But we were sort of like the, uh, um, the English majors of the 50s. Yeah, that's right. We were the film majors of the of the '70s coming into into professional realm in in the '80s. So it's a special community, actually, of people who who are now we're now the old guys. How that I don't know how that happened, but you know, it's it's that's the way it works. It's, it's the way it works. So uh, I hope that answers that. I mean, yeah. I kind of got off into a. a no, I, I really, I really, I really appreciate that. So, it's, so for students, let me let me yeah. bring that back around. It's this thing of. Um, Approach your, your education holistically. Mm -hmm. 
be respectful above and below your station in any circumstance that you're in. Mm -hmm. You don't know that that third, that third you know, electrician isn't gonna be the head of the studio in two years because of, the of, the, of his incredible talent at writing. Right. You, don't, you come from that place of mutuality and respect and bring that onto the set. Don't let your fear and your anger drive your daily work. Set your ego, have an ego, but channel it to the work, mm -hmm. to the project not to some sense of your personal sphere of, of jurisdiction, of territory. Yeah. You know, if you can stay selfless in the pursuit of yourself, you know, the, the Spencer Tracy dictum, I'm powerful, you know, you know, I, you know, take your work very seriously, but don't take yourself so seriously. You yeah. can survive because now you can adapt like musicians, session players do, to all the different leaderships that they have to engage in to become, you know, fluent. Fluent in your instrument, but fluent in your, your, your diplomacy. So that you not only can survive, but that you can enjoy. If you don't project a sense of enjoyment that's genuine, that's authentic, um, I, this isn't the thing. You're gonna be working 80, 90, it's ridiculous. It's completely uncivilized working on movies. You it's know? true, and if you don't have that sense of joy about your work, you're probably not gonna get invited to come back again on the next one. Uh, by all means, you know, and you're not gonna be that good. Right. Because you're gonna you're gonna become you know dogmatic about approach. Can't do it that way. You know that you know they can't overlap. What do you mean they can't? Oh yeah. Right. See ya. You know um, not only can they overlap, but you better get that in ways that are absolutely functional for the storytelling that's happening with that. Because you never do know. it great. Don't just know. do it. Do this, it great. This director may completely change the form with what they're with what they're. No doing. question. Yeah. No, you know so so be open to the possibility of of discovering something new. That's right. what art's about, you right. know? It's a, it's a mystery, you know? What's the line in, in uh, Shakespeare, uh, you know, in love? You know, it is a mystery, you know, Jeff uh, Rush, you know, it is right. a mystery, you know? It's, uh, and, and love that mystery. Do you stay uh, in touch with the, the post-production teams as they're going, as they're mixing the film? Do you, 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 I do, you, I, 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 in pre-production, yeah. during production. We are a triangle, we're like a stool, right? you know? Um, not everybody sees it that way. Not everyone who does what I do sees it that way, but if you if you look closely, you'll find the you know Lee Orloff and Peter Devlin and Ron Judkins and you know all of all of the we're all of the same age and same journey. We all have that you know fine arts thing about we're here as collaborators as right. creatives. You know the sound area is one of the least recognized as creatives in production in people for people who you know why would we want to take the sound mixer on the, on the tech scout? You know, we'll tell them. Yeah. Well, maybe it's not just seeing those locations and being a canary in the cave for possible, you know, obstacles to the work, but also to witness the dynamic going on between the director and the and the DP and the first AD and the fights they may or may not have and the ideas that they're revealing and as they're unfolding in the physical presence. You know, there's so much of of inclus inclusion that that supports the project in ways that are not going to be, you know, something that shows up on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, a, a statement, a financial document. Sure. Um, you know, David Lean said when the AFI did that big thing, you know, let the bee encounters be in partnership with the creatives, not, in, not over, not under, but together. And not in opposition. And not in opposition, yeah. you know, that we're not, you're not enemies. <laughs> you know, if it doesn't work, everybody suffers. Sure. And it's hard enough to get it to work when everything's right. <laughs> no, but the point I'm making is that that um, the very worst movies are as hard to make as the very best movies. That's right. And, and the, we all know there are a million and one ways they can go wrong. Uh, truly, you know. Yeah. And so, so why why put obstacles in the front end? You know, share the information. Yeah. Um, bring your bring your creatives. The problem with sound is it's not always recognized as you know we're kind of the alchemists, we're the oddball, you know, and what we do is invisible. Oh, there are those machines, yeah. and people don't understand it. Those machines, right. that's what they do. They're like my, you know, and I don't not a knock at plumbers. God, I, you know, can you imagine a world without plumbers? We'd be in really no, no never mind. I, I but, see where you're going with that. <laughs> that was not. I, but respect. Yeah. This is the point, you know. Respect people who are compassionate and committed to. The discipline. I get so many questions from friends who are going to do their own pri personal project. I, I'm doing a project. I really have no resources. I don't really need a sound what's, guy. Do what's, I? what's the what's the microphone I should get to solve this? Yeah. And I, I always I'm like, how long are you working in the what business? 
How long have you known me? Not just yeah. me, but you know, <laughs> you, w- your best tool, your cheapest option right. is to get an individual who's passionately committed to right. executing your intent yeah. each and every day in that realm, the way your DP does, your yeah. production designer does, your editor. I don't you know, want, do you care if people hear your dialogue? You, I don't, I don't. <laughs> your, your, you, why quarantine that right. away just because it's not, and the film schools are not doing this, they're not teaching That's it. That's right. And even there's a very prominent and famous film school based here in Hollywood, not, not, it's, it's not one of the universities. It, it has three initials, and I won't say, and I've, I've spoken there. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't teach sound. Yeah. They have hundreds of photographs in the halls there. Now, one of them has uh, you know, an iconic sound pioneer or creator. Yeah. Um, they hire sound people to do their student films. That's right. Instead of teaching what is a profoundly you know, significant career. A boom operator, first rate, triple A, they're, they're at six figures a year in, 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 uh, in a career. You know, th- this is not, we're, 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 you know, so so it's a weird disconnect in Hollywood yeah. in, in that way sometimes. Yeah. So I probably treaded on some toes there. I, have to I just have one final question for sure. you. Sure. Are you religious about getting room tone? No, <laughs> I am not. I had been in an era where we were not doing the work the way we do it now. Um, but the truth is, if you speak to anybody who's in post right now, they almost won't ever use the room tone because the room tone, we've done the scene from 9 a.m. to noon, we broke for lunch, and then we came back at, at 1.30, and now the traffic's different out there, and the lights the, room, are, the tone changes, right, through the day, sure. And it's always an approximation. It's, it it ha- has been sort of a iconic special tool, but the way room tone's done today is they go into the scene, and they find all of the spaces between the words in the scene and they build the tone from the scene itself. So right. it's absolutely invisible when it's applied. And it's a much better approach to making room tone. So there will be times where there's a unique thing that you need thing to get. that right. is particular <clears throat> and signature to an environment. And in that circumstance, yes. And there's another piece that I'll do now that I wasn't doing then, which is depending on what the nature of the scene is, I will also do simultaneous synchronous effects and ambience recordings in 5.1, separate from the scene. Oh, really? To build, if, if there's something environmentally that's significant Can you in give me exa- an example of- Hateful uh, Eight, we, you, know, you know, we're in all these wilderness spaces and there's a kind of special silence. <laughs> sure. And, and, you know, in that movie also, the wind was a character and uh, an orchestration. The wind was, uh, was almost, in many ways, the score of the movie. Mm. And we would create versions of wind everywhere. There's 30 different kinds of snow and wind. And it was my biggest worry about that film. But I also tested extensively with Isotope in those days, which mm-hmm. evolved quite a bit since then. But it was still, you know, those days, I mean, it was four years ago, five years ago. Um, the idea that we could mitigate specific things that in the past would be unimaginable is a tool we have now. And it's right. essential for production people to be knowledgeable about that evolution in post, to go sit in the mix, in the mix sure, stage, that's right. to understand, to go to symposiums about the teaching of those things, even if they're designed around the post community. Know your tools, know your instrument. You know, right. no, no, the d- drummers have what two, I don't know if you're a musician or not, I'm but not, yeah. okay, well, in drumming, there's two grips that are dominant, you know, for, for conventional drumming. One is called the conventional grip, which is two different axes, sure. uh-huh. and the other is match grip, which is like mallets, but a lot of rock drummers do, you know, and so there's, there's this endless debate, like beta cam, you know, <laughs> uh, VHS, right. which is, and the answer is, Dummy, it's both. You sure. need both. They each have function. They each have application. They do different, they do different things. And you're fully, you're fully equipped if you know fluently both of, those, both of those techniques because they have specific purposes and they're not the enemy of each other. It's crazy to, to, to you know, so that's the kind of thing that film students should, there's a, and this is a big generalization, but there's a potential for film students to have a, um, a bias mm-hmm. about the process, about themselves, about what is, you know, and, and sometimes that gets very much in the way of the outcome. And it's, it's really, to, you know, this idea of learn how to be selfless in the project and yourself will emerge through that selflessness. It's a very Zen kind of thing, but, but uh, it, it's really true. Yeah. You know, a Bob Richardson, you know, who is sure. this, you know, 10 times nominated, three Oscars and, you and know, nominated again. And, yeah, this is the 10th time. And, and, and Qu- Quentin calls him Oscar Richardson the third, you know, <laughs> uh, 
That's his nickname on the set. Uh, I'm the bear, which I'm trying to move away from uh-huh. because it's not for good reasons. Um, is is a perfect example of applying that ego towards the project and not towards the self in my territory. Mm. These guys have nothing to prove right. except to try and contribute to the specifics of the thing they're involved in with all they have, every bit. And um, when I see that, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm done. I'm, I, commitment is, is, is you know, the most sexy thing I can think of on, in the world is, no, seriously, yeah. in, in a film set, when musicians can come together and, and communicate non-verbally, that same thing happens on a movie set. Sure does. And the shorthand of that gives so much, so much more resource back to the director, so much freedom of energy that isn't directed around trying to be micromanaging all of these other things because of the trust that comes out of knowing his musicians know how what he's doing and interprets his intent. He's now free to be inside that, that bubble with the actors and make everything that could happen, happen. Mm-hmm. That's great. Well, Mark, I th- it's been a great conversation. I hope so. I Thank hope you so much for coming on the show sure. and for doing this. Um, Mark Ulano, congratulations. This is your third and fourth nominations. True. And you uh, won an Oscar previously for Titanic. The boat movie, yeah, that's true. That boat movie. <laughs> so who knows what'll happen in a couple of weeks. I at the had theater. no expectation. This year is there's so much great work out there. There's the, you know, that we have music movies, we have car mm-hmm. movies, we have war movies. You know, these are, pre- these are predominantly, and the, and the uh, constituency in the branch, which nominates, right. is prom- predominantly post-production. Post-production folks, right. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a 85 to 15%. Well, but now know. it's gonna be in the hands of the actors, right? And now, well, everybody, <laughs> yes, but that's true. And, you know, so uh, I don't, I, just being, just being sort of kissed and hugged by your your colleagues. It's a cliche is, that the honor is to be nominated, but in the, and with the Oscars, it actually is really true because really the nomination true. is coming from your peers and it's, your branch. Especially right. in sound. Right. Especially in sound, because the people who do sound, they know. That's right. <laughs> and they 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 are you know, um, and you know you'll talk to Mike and 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 Wiley tomorrow and Chris and they'll you know, they're they're of the same stripe. They're always looking for the best version of something they're always trying to feel the the subtleties of mood in the director and anticipate in response by by the old the evolved relationship right. and it shows up in the work i don't i don't know how you feel about once upon a time but for me it's a transitional film mm-hmm. in many ways it, it's it's about gratitude um acceptance and love and all kinds of themes that people would never attribute to to Quentin, but if you look closely at his other films, they're there. But here, it's really, I, I was part of a, a q and I'm sorry, I know we're done, but q and at the Academy, for the Academy screening of the film for sure. the members. Mm-hmm. They turned two, over 200 people away because Amazing. you couldn't get in and they had a second screening. But at the end of that screening, now that's not a demographic normally you would def, you know, affiliate with Quentin's big, biggest fan base. Sure, It's an older group. There, you know, there are other kinds of things. They were enthralled with the movie. They were in love with the movie. You could see it. And, and, and I, I just, I don't know. For me, I revere the Academy mm-hmm. because of its institutional history, what its significance is. With its flaws and blemishes and all the rest of that, I love, I love the institution as, as, a, as a sort of a steward or protector of, you know, a certain kind of idealism towards making movies. And, um, and when, when Quentin has, has reached that group, I know, I know we're in new Something's, territory. Something Some, good has happened. Something good has happened. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll shut up now. <laughs> it's been a great conversation. It's been so much fun talking to you. Thank you for it. having me. I, I, I hope, uh, you know, I hope I've been able to contribute something here. Absolutely. I'm here to contribute, not to compete. That's, that's you know. Sounds good, and good luck motto. in a couple weeks at the Dolby Theater. I've already had the good luck. Whatever happens now is just gravy. All know? right. Till next time.